So we can speak to studying the, the nature of the way things are. And we have actually a foundation for this study already. For instance, being a doctor or a nurse, we care for the sick. And so one who has such a profession has uh, a good foundation for studying nature already, the nature of impermanence, the nature of change, the nature of dukkha, of not-self. But we need to practice and train our minds in peacefulness in order to understand clearly. We need to have mindfulness to be able to see uh, clearly in our own hearts in order to have wisdom arise in the present moment. We see that a person that has uh, a quick wisdom or intelligence has practiced uh, shamatha and vipassana already, these qualities of tranquility and clear insight. And then when they come into this life, they can have uh, good mindfulness and wisdom already. And studies are not that difficult for them. There's someone who's easy to teach and who learns quickly and easily. So we can observe this ourselves. That as someone who has good mindfulness and wisdom, they're easy to teach. You can tell them something uh, simply or tell them just one time and they understand already. They understand easily. We can, for instance, recollect the example of Venerable Sariputta. When Venerable Asaji Tara uh, taught him for the first time, Venerable Asaji explained just a little bit. It wasn't a lot. It was just an abbreviated uh, teaching. But Venerable Sariputta was able to understand uh, right then and there from that short teaching because Venerable Sariputta had already done a lot of study. He had already done a lot of meditation and trained his mind to a very high degree already. He was someone of uh, great mindfulness and wisdom already. We can also look to other examples in the Buddha's time. For instance, in the time of the Buddha, there were many uh, female monastics who studied outside of the Buddha's dispensation or in various other uh, lineages and other types of uh, female ascetics and so on. And so there are many individuals like this. And there was one such individual named Kundala Kesa. She was an ascetic outside of the Buddhist dispensation who was known uh, around India to excel in debate. She was a great debater and could uh, win many debates through her quick wisdom. And there was one occasion where she went to the uh, city where Venerable Sariputta was staying, and they ended up engaging in a, in a debate between Venerable Sariputta and Kundala Kesa. And after Kundala Kesa asked Venerable Sariputta many different questions, Sariputta was able to answer all these questions uh, correctly and immediately. But when it was Sariputta's turn to ask questions, he asked just one question, what is the one? And Kundala Kesa was, <coughs> was not able to answer this one question. Because Venerable Sariputta was referring to one teaching of the Buddha that all materiality and mentality is impermanent, uh, stressful and not self. This is the one. So after this debate, uh, Kundala Kesa, the ascetic Kundala Kesa, ordained in the Buddhist dispensation as a bhikkhuni, and she was able to succeed to realizing arahantship and became uh, Bada Kundala Kesa Teri, the bhikkhuni foremost in uh, quick knowledge and quick wisdom. So we see, we see that she had a lot of wisdom. So for ourselves, we have an opportunity to rejoice in the merit and goodness that a loved one uh, or family member is engaged in. Someone who's 
making uh, or giving the opportunity for the Buddha's dispensation to continue uh, to extend onward because uh, your relative is ordaining as a monastic. So sometimes we have a relative ordain and they ordain for not a long time. For instance, 15 days or one month, they ordain as a uh, monastic. But even if it's uh, just a relatively short time like this, this is still uh, helping the Buddhist dispensation to continue on, to extend the, uh, the life of the Buddhist dispensation. And it gives the individual ordaining the opportunity to understand the Dhamma, to practice the Dhamma more than before. And having practiced the Dhamma, then they can know about Dhamma practice and then go and spread this to others, teach this to others, and recommend Dhamma practice to others, to those who don't know about it. So we recollect that this Dhamma practice that the Buddha taught, uh, for instance, having, uh, or the existence of Nibbana, we see that Nibbana uh, truly exists. And we believe that. We believe that uh, hell exists, heaven exists, uh, Brahma worlds exist, uh, the various realms exist. And we may have studied in science and in science, uh, things have to be provable. One must be able to prove uh, the things in science. And so we ask about uh, these uh, hell realms and heaven realms and Brahma realms. And in truth, we are able to prove the existence of these realms. But in order to prove them, we have to bring our minds to peace and collectedness, to samadhi. And once our minds are, are peaceful in samadhi, then we're able to prove uh, about heaven, hell, the various deva realms who are able to do this. There are even some individuals who sit in meditation and they're able to meet the, the Lord Buddha. They actually see the Buddha for themselves. They see the Buddha in his uh, Dhamma body, that, the body which is uh, the Dhamma. And we can also say it's the Buddha that has a a heavenly body or subtle body. And so people are able to see the Buddha in this way if their minds are peaceful. And having seen like this, then such individuals believe that the Buddha really exists in truth. Uh, the Buddha does exist, the Dhamma and the Sangha also exist in truth. And also hell, heaven, the Brahma worlds also exist as well. And if we look at it uh, more simply, we see that all these things exist in the heart. They're all right here in our own hearts and minds. And we see that the mind that has greed, aversion, and delusion, if we're not able to uh, control the mind and keep a watch over it, then right here in the mind, this mind can be hell or it can be heaven. We can also recollect the story of a certain uh, Brahmin. And this Brahmin was a nephew of Venerable Sariputta named Diga Naka Brahmin. And his name meant uh, long, the long-nailed Brahmin, the Brahmin with long nails. And at that time, in the Buddhist time, the uh, Brahmins in India had many types of views and thought uh, various things. And so this particular Brahmin, Diganaka Brahmin, he thought that he wanted to go to a mountain where no one had ever died before. And he wanted to go to that mountain uh, to die in a place that was pure because no one else had ever died there. And on that mountain, he met the Buddha. And the Buddha told him, well, actually, on this very mountain, you yourself have died here uh, many, many times. And so he the Buddha taught this Brahman that he had been born uh, many, many times and that there's no place in the world you can find where you haven't already died. And Diganaka Brahman felt great uh, weariness and dispassion towards the world and desire to escape the world. 
seeing that he had died even in that very spot so many times. So we can see that he had faith and believed in what the Buddha was telling him. And he had this view that whatever it was that he liked, that's what he wanted. And whatever he didn't like, that's what he didn't want. He just wanted what he liked. And he told this view to the Buddha. But the Buddha told him that this view of yours is wrong. It's not correct. Because that which you dislike, you must receive all the same. So therefore your view is, is wrong. So the Buddha asked him, well, do you like old age? Do you like sickness? Do you like death? And then the Brahmin answered, no, I don't like these things. And then the Buddha said, well, will you get them all the same? The Brahmin said, well, yes, I must receive these things. So the Buddha said, well, you don't like them, but you have to receive them. So is this, is this uh, happiness or suffering? And the Brahmin answered, well, it's suffering. So therefore the Brahmin was able to listen to the teachings of the Buddha and see that in this world it's not possible to receive only that which we like. Because of this body we can't control and force it to be uh, the way we want it to be. We can't force the body not to age, not to sicken, not to die. We can't control the outer conditions in the world. So at this point, the Diganaka Brahman understood that all things arise, stay for a little while, and cease, and that one shouldn't cling to them. And so the mind of the Brahman entered the stream to Nibbana. We call this stream entry, Sotapanna. And realizing Sotapanna like this, it's not something that's difficult. We merely need to understand the truth and accept it except the truth of materiality and mentality, that all materiality and mentality have the characteristic of impermanence, of change, of stress and suffering, and of not self, not being me, mine, you or yours. So in truth, this is how it is. And in uh, conventionally speaking, there are things that we call me and mine, you and yours, or self, but in, on a deeper level or in truth, these things merely arise, stay for a little while, and cease. For instance, our bodies, these material things in the world, are the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water temporarily gathered together. And if any of these elements are out of balance with the others, then illness arises. And then we use uh, medicines to cure the body, or we seek out a doctor or we use food uh, to care for our bodies, and we use our breath to care for these bodies, and the fire element as well we use to care for these bodies. And if any of these elements are missing or imbalanced, then illness arises. So we see that, uh, therefore, that the world is, is in us. The world is found uh, right here in ourselves. And so Diganaka Brahman accepted that condition formations, all sankharas are this way. And he then uh, praised the Lord Buddha, that the Buddha was one who showed the way to one who was lost, turned upright that which was overturned, and gave illumination so that those with eyes could see forms. And he saw that everything in the world or that all beings in the world all want happiness, and no one wants suffering. But when we receive sense impressions, the world is not capable of following our wishes and our desires. The world goes the way of nature. It follows its own nature. It's just like the various streams and rivers that enter the ocean. We can stand at the mouths of those rivers and wish that the water would flow back up the river, that the water would flow back up into the land and uphill. But the river simply can't do this. That's not its nature. The river can't go against its flow. The, the water has to enter the ocean. So therefore we practice to know the truth of nature, 
of conditioned things, that all things arise, stay for a little while, and cease. So we come together to practice the Dhamma, and having ordained this is an opportunity to practice Dhamma, to study the truth of the way things are, in order to accept that truth in our hearts. To practice to have wisdom, to have vipassana, this quality of clear seeing, to accept the truth, to accept the truth of conditioned things, that all material things and all mental things have arising, staying for a little while and ceasing. So for those that have ordained, uh, those that have ordained have the time to practice, have more time, because they don't have to spend time seeking out the four requisites of clothing, food, uh, medicine, and shelter, because the faithful laity have offered these four requisites already. And so therefore those that have ordained can meditate and train their minds uh, all the time to the fullness of their uh, ener energy and, of it and capability, doing walking and sitting meditation to bring the mind to peace and collectedness. And one of the ways to bring the mind to peace is that which the preceptor taught during the ordination ceremony. And the preceptor taught the five meditation objects of hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. Or one can also observe the in and out breathing or recollect death, recollect the merit one has done or recollect the Buddha. Because in a given day, when the mind keeps recollecting things about the past or the future, then the mind uh, isn't peaceful, it's not collected. So we practice to recollect in the present moment the four foundations of mindfulness, which are uh, foundational in our mindfulness practice. For instance, mindfulness of the body, we recollect this physical body, which is called Gaya Nupasana. And this term, uh, well, Gaya means body, and Nupasana means the wisdom to know about the body. So if we're a doctor or a nurse, we know about the body already to a certain degree, or perhaps uh, we haven't studied about this ourselves. But whatever the case is, we use the foundation of mindfulness of body recollection to bring the mind to peace and collectedness. And this is a shamatha kamatana, a meditation object to bring the mind to tranquility, to peace. And when the mind is peaceful and collected in shamatha already, then we study about the truth of reality that having been born, that which we experience is uh, impermanent, it's ever-changing. These bodies are constantly degrading and moving on to uh, death and decay. So if our mind is peaceful and collected when we contemplate, we can see the truth of the body, the truth of materiality and mentality to a deeper level. And this is wisdom that arises from vipassana, from uh, clear seeing. It's the wisdom to know clearly the way things are. So in our lives we've studied various subjects in order to gain a livelihood in the world. And there are many types of subjects that we've studied for this purpose. We study and give rise to knowledge, and we use uh, our body and minds in this way. And if we've done meditation in the past, then we'll have a quick mindfulness and wisdom, we'll have intelligence, and we'll be able to study and learn easily and quickly. But this uh, science of the Buddha, this the Buddha's uh, or subject of Buddhism, is something that perhaps we haven't yet studied. Because in the world we study in order to gain the four requisites in order to live in the world. But this type of study is not capable of curing the suffering in our hearts. 
but this uh, subject uh, that the Buddha taught, this science of the Buddha, it's able to cure the suffering in our hearts. For instance, one that's of an aversive character type, one who gets angry easily, they can do the meditation on loving kindness to bring their mind to peace. And someone of this character type, of the aversive character type, can have a quick wisdom, quick intelligence. They can know and understand things quickly and easily. And they're able to cut off uh, clinging and attachment and worries more easily as well. And for someone of a deluded character type, they should recollect death. And for someone of a, a greedy or lustful character type, they should contemplate the body as a subha, as not beautiful, to have mindfulness with the body in this way. So whatever our character type is, we practice to bring the mind to peace and collectedness in the present moment. So we have a relative that's come here to ordain to study about and understand the truth of life. So having been born already, we must meet with old age, sickness and death. This is normal and natural. We must be separated from that which we love. So we practice to understand uh, this uh, through uh, Dhamma practice. And for the laity, they may have not much time to practice and study the Dhamma. But whatever the case is in our lives, that we have, we try to understand the truth of reality. We try to understand all outer phenomena, that which we think is permanent, that which, that which we think is beautiful. We practice to see it as something that's ever-changing, that's impermanent, that's uh, stressful, that's not self. We see that all phenomena, all things are the same in this way. They all have these characteristics of anicca, dukkha, anatta. And when we understand this, then we understand the teachings of the Buddha. So therefore we must be well established in heedfulness in our lives. And we train ourselves to uh, meditate, to cultivate our minds. And the benefits of uh, teaching our relatives, of helping our uh, friends and relatives and loved ones, the benefits of this last for many eons. So this is a great merit. And also ordaining in the Buddha's dispensation helps the Buddha sasana to continue and last longer. So may you all uh, understand and comprehend the teachings of the Buddha and uh, rejoice in the merit of your relative ordaining in the Buddha Sasana. So now we have the opportunity to sit in meditation together and then receive the blessing. <laughs>